Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Let's take up the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at a column from page number 6 of the Delhi edition. This column written by Sri Ram Panchu examines the retirement age of Supreme Court judges and calls for reforms to India's higher judiciary. But before we analyze the column, first we need to understand the context in which this column has been brought out by the Hindu. See, there have been unconfirmed reports that the government is looking to increase the retirement age of supreme court judges from the present 65 years to 67 years this change if effected is likely to affect the appointment process of not just the future supreme court judges but also the appointment of the chief justice of india it is likely to have an impact on the seniority matrix which is followed under the collegium system for appointing supreme court judges and the chief justice of india and it is even likely to affect the succession line thereby bringing the government into a conflict with the supreme court so in this context before we understand the details of the article first let's talk about the appointment process of supreme court judges and the chief justice of india and as well as their retirement age see the indian constitution provides for the appointment of judges to the supreme court and the high courts under article 124 and 217 respectively as per these constitutional provisions it is the president of india who has the power to make the appointments of judges but however this is not a discretionary power enjoyed by the president and nor does this power lie entirely with the council of ministers who aid and advise the president the president can appoint judges only after having consultation with judges of the supreme court and the high courts and in this appointment process the president that is by extension the government is bound to abide by the recommendations provided by the collegium with regard to making appointments to the higher judiciary see in practice this power to appoint judges to the higher judiciary was held by the executive that is by the government at least until the 1980s until then the seniority system was being followed by the government in appointing judges including the chief justice of india but this power to appoint judges to the higher judiciary was taken away by the government through a series of rulings by the supreme court in which the judiciary took away the power to appoint judges from the government and gave these powers to itself it was between the 1980s and 1990s that the supreme court evolved the collegium system of appointment and ever since the government that is the president who acts as the head of the executive is bound by the recommendations of the collegium and even though the government can delay the appointment or hold back on the appointments and even ask the collegium to reconsider the names it however cannot go against the recommendations of the collegium so this lies at the very heart of the conflict between the supreme court and the government with regard to appointment of judges to the higher judiciary and this has led to a significant impact on the judicial process and as well as on the efficiency of the judiciary the government has long argued that the executive should also have a say in the appointment of judges in a manner that existed before the 1980s but however the supreme court has justified the collegium system in order to retain its independence and autonomy and to insulate itself from any unnecessary interference from the executive but the supreme court's collegium system has also been heavily criticized for being too opaque and even though it largely follows the seniority matrix it tends to evade any accountability or transparency in the appointment process see this tussle between the executive and the judiciary over the appointment of judges began in 1973 when the then indira gandhi government violated the seniority matrix and superseded three senior judges to appoint justice a n ray as the chief justice of india this led the supreme court to believe that the appointment powers of the government has to be curbed and through a series of rulings in three cases known as the judges cases in 1981 93 and 1998 the supreme court evolved the collegium system for appointing judges through which the president was bound to abide by the recommendations of the collegium and this not only shrank the power of the executive in appointing judges but it also took away the executive's veto power to reject a candidate under the collegium system as i said the government can delay the appointment or hold back on the appointment but it cannot reject the candidate recommended by the collegium 
the president who is acting on the aid and advice of the council of ministers can send back the recommendation to the collegium and ask for a reconsideration but however the president cannot veto the recommendations of the collegium and this essentially gives the collegium complete control over the appointment process in the first judges case of 1981 that is sp gupta versus union of india the supreme court ruled that the president does not require the concurrence of the chief justice of india in appointment of judges this ruling actually affirmed the preeminence of the executive in appointing judges but this was later overturned in the second judges case that is the supreme court advocates on record association versus union of india 1993 in which a nine judge constitution bench provided for the establishment of the collegium system for appointing judges so this bound the president to consult the collegium which is essentially a group of senior judges headed by the chief justice and to take their recommendations while appointing judges in this landmark case the supreme court justified its decision to appoint judges on its own and acknowledged that even though this was violating doctrine of separation of powers and even though it was deviating from the text of the constitution the supreme court said that such a move was necessary in order to guard and protect the independence of the judiciary in order to curb any unnecessary interference from the executive so that the court could protect its integrity so since then the collegium system of appointment of judges including the chief justice has become the norm but even this system has been criticized by experts for lack of transparency and accountability to address this issue the government introduced the njac or the national judicial appointments commission through a constitutional amendment in 2014 which would have given the executive partial control again in the appointment process but later the supreme court which was opposed to the njac declared the 99th constitutional amendment act as unconstitutional thereby reestablishing the control of the collegium system over the appointment process then coming to the retirement age of judges in the higher judiciary supreme court judges currently retire at the age of 65 years whereas high court judges currently retire at the age of 62 years but there have been reports over the last few years that the government is considering a proposal to increase the retirement age of supreme court judges from the current 65 years to 67 years along with increasing the retirement age of high court judges from 62 to 65 years according to reports the ministry of law and justice has been considering this proposal following a recommendation from a parliamentary standing committee that sought to increase the retirement age of judges in order to help retain experienced judges so that it would not only reduce the vacancy at the higher courts but would also help in reducing the backlog of cases and would also help the judicial system to effectively utilize the wisdom of experienced judges the same argument was made by the venkata chalaya report that is the report of the national commission to review the working of the constitution and even this committee had recommended that the retirement age of judges of high court and supreme court should be increased in fact back in 2010 a constitutional amendment bill was introduced by the government to raise the retirement age of high court judges to 65 however this bill was never taken up as the 15th lok sabha was dissolved and the bill lapsed in the parliament actually there are several arguments in favor of increasing the retirement age of judges because this is often the case in western democracies as well it's quite common in western liberal democracies to have the retirement age for judges at around 70 years or sometimes even more than that in some countries judges can opt for tenures for life thereby allowing experienced judges to contribute to the judicial system through their experience and wisdom for example in the us supreme court and as well as in the constitutional courts of austria and greece judges are appointed for life in other liberal democracies like belgium denmark ireland netherlands norway and australia the retirement age for judges is over 70 years so in this context there is a debate even in india to increase the retirement age of judges and the writer helps us understand this in more detail with the help of this column the writer argues that there is definitely a need for reforms not just with regard to the retirement age of supreme court judges but even with regard to the retirement age of high court judges he argues 
that there is no logic behind having different retirement ages for high court and supreme court judges he argues for a higher uniform retirement age at both high courts and supreme court so that it will not only help in bringing down vacancies at higher courts but will also help in clearing the backlog of cases and more importantly it will help the judicial system to utilize the wisdom and experience of senior judges then he also argues that reforms of india's higher judiciary should go beyond the mere question of retirement age of judges and should create a more transparent and merit based system which should help the judiciary to imbibe a culture of service that is service towards the nation and the people and to serve justice to the citizens equally in a free fair transparent and swift manner and we need an appointment system which can help in choosing true leaders as the next chief justice who can transform and revolutionize the way the indian judiciary has been performing the writer argues that such wide sweeping reforms are necessary in india's higher judiciary to not just strengthen the indian democracy but also to deliver justice to the people of india now let's take up another column from page number 7 that calls for a new set of global standard for ai ethics see ai or artificial intelligence is one of the emerging technologies along with 5g internet of things or iot and big data and the others which are driving the fourth stage of the industrial revolution today ai has already become omnipresent and it is already making its presence felt in our day to day lives from our mobile phones to electronic appliances and from our cars to even traffic signals almost every technology is being driven by some form of ai or the other and this no doubt has the potential to revolutionize the economy it can bring enormous benefits to agriculture industrial automation weather forecasting and even with regard to space technology and weapons development but along with these numerous advantages of ai it also raises several risks and threats primarily due to its potential for misuse as we discussed in a recent session artificial intelligence platforms they are based on machine learning technology where the machine and the algorithm learns based on the data that it is being fed with but since the data that is being fed into the machines that is into the ai algorithms comes from the real world it also carries along with it the same biases and discrimination that you find in the society and these biases and discrimination will also be inculcated by the machines and the ai algorithms this poses a significant risk with regard to the future of ai and brings up the question of ethics in artificial intelligence take for example how biases and discrimination has been developed in facial recognition systems studies around the world have shown that facial recognition softwares have developed a inbuilt bias towards minorities and they are known to wrongly identify religious racial and gender minorities such as asians africans women and even muslims essentially ai platforms feed on the data coming from the real world and they start inculcating the same biases and phobias and this happens to be one of the biggest ethical concerns with regard to the misuse of ai platforms it's because of this reason that a global movement was going on over the last few years to develop a global code for ethics in ai so that it could be uniformly adopted by all the major countries including india see india has already emerged as a major market for artificial intelligence which has been valued at over 7.8 billion dollars as of 2021 india's niti aayog has been placing a lot of focus on artificial intelligence and ai driven governance since it launched the national strategy on artificial intelligence back in 2018 the niti aayog envisions ai as a potential technology that can solve complex social and economic challenges across the sectors of agriculture healthcare education etc the niti aayog also envisions a role for ai in governance and in this context it becomes very very important to prioritize ethical ai governance the niti aayog has already taken this into account and it has been trying to promote inclusive governance through ai platforms and has even launched 
hashtag AI for all campaign to ensure that AI technologies and platforms are not discriminatory against any communities. Following years of global movement for ethics in AI, under the leadership of UNESCO, recently a global agreement was signed that provides for the first ever global agreement on ethics of AI. This global agreement on ethics of AI led by UNESCO was signed last year in November and this happens to be the first ever global standard on ethics that has been adopted for artificial intelligence. This agreement contains a set of recommendations for the members of UNESCO and it lays down a set of common values and principles that the member countries are going to adopt through their national laws which seeks to create a legal framework in every country to ensure that the AI ecosystem and its development happens in an ethical and healthy manner. And these recommendations are based on three main parts, that is values, principles and strategic areas. Under these three main parts, the primary focus of the global agreement is on protecting data, that is data security and data privacy of the individuals, along with banning social scoring, that is social profiling of communities based on their race, religion, color, and to prevent the deployment of AI technologies for mass surveillance. It also focuses on helping to monitor and evaluate the development of AI technologies so that their applications are ethical, while keeping in mind the environmental concerns that might be raised through rapid adoption and deployment of AI platforms. The UNESCO Global Agreement recognizes that emerging technologies such as AI they have proven to have immense potential and capacity to provide benefits for humanity and the society. But at the same time, there are several negative impacts of these technologies and this has been acknowledged by the UNESCO's Global Agreement on Ethics of AI. The agreement acknowledges that such emerging technologies can further widen the existing divides and create a more unequal world. And hence, UNESCO members have committed to develop AI platforms by abiding to rule of law, avoiding harm to humans, and ensuring that when harm does happen to humans or even to the environment or society, there will be accountability, along with redressal mechanisms to provide justice to the victims, along with upholding their rights. These recommendations of the UNESCO agreement applies for all the member states, and member countries have committed to introduce laws that will apply to not just to the respective governments, but also to businesses. And these ethical guidelines will apply across the chain, starting right from research and development to deployment and usage of AI platforms. The recommendations are designed to address the biases, risks to privacy, and the question of protecting human rights, which are at the risk of being affected due to the risks posed by the misuse of AI technologies. So in short, UNESCO's global agreement on the ethics of AI shifts the balance of power towards the people, that is towards humanity, by placing restrictions and curbs on governments and companies when it comes to development of AI platforms. Next, we have a couple of articles on page number 6 and page number 7 that examine the upcoming auction of 5G spectrum in India. See, as you know, 5G communication technology also happens to be one of the emerging technologies that is said to have tremendous potential to alter our day-to-day -day lives. It is considered to be the future of communication technology that will provide for high-speed, high-bandwidth, low-latency internet that can make possible a number of futuristic technologies and applications, including autonomous vehicles, which essentially would be based on artificial intelligence, and even smart agriculture and smart homes, which would be based on IoT or Internet of Things, and it is also expected to transform banking, finance, and even e-governance and delivery of services from the government. So considering these enormous benefits of 5G communication technology, the government of India has taken the right steps to roll out 5G spectrum in India. And as promised in this year's union budget, the government has obtained the approval from the telecom regulatory body that is TRI or the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India and last week, the Union Cabinet has given the go-ahead to conduct the first auction of 5G spectrum in the Indian market. The speed at which the government has made this happen is definitely commendable, and it points to the government's intention 
that it doesn't want india to be left behind this critical technology because many countries around the world they've already taken a leap ahead of india when it comes to introducing 5g technology so as per the specifications of the telecom industry the government has set aside three separate bands of frequency that will be allocated for 5g networks which includes a sub 1 gigahertz range that is below 1 gigahertz and a c band frequency of 3.3 gigahertz and a ultra high frequency at 26 gigahertz these are the frequencies at which 5g networks are supposed to operate which will deliver high speed high bandwidth internet and will enable the introduction and deployment of technologies such as artificial intelligence and internet of things but the biggest concern about india's proposed auction is the price band that has been set by the government as the reserve price that has been approved by the cabinet is considered to be extremely high for the telecom operators and it might become a entry barrier for smaller companies and thereby it could limit the availability of the technology and its services only to a elite few who can afford expensive services see the indian telecom and internet market has already become a duopoly between jio and airtel and in this mega battle for the market between these two large companies the smaller companies have already lost out in such a market environment if the government is setting a very high reserve price band for auctioning the assigned frequency bands on the 5g spectrum then it will virtually end up eliminating the small companies from the race and will allow the larger companies to dominate and eventually the services that they are going to provide would also be very expensive and unaffordable to the common man and would thus end up limiting access to critical applications of 5g networks in fact a study by business insider shows that the price band set in india happens to be one of the highest in the world for 5g spectrum and this might not only impact the business model of the companies but will eventually result in expensive services which could end up making 5g services non inclusive thereby depriving the lower sections from the benefits of 5g technology it is in this context that the editorial and as well as the column both are urging the government to review the price band that has been set for the upcoming auction of 5g spectrum now coming to the last topic let's take up this article from page number 9 which evaluates the anti defection law this topic is in news in the context of the political crisis that has hit the maharashtra state government where potentially the legislators of the ruling party are looking to defect thereby threatening the stability of the elected government so in this context the writer evaluates the anti defection law but first let's go one step beyond the article and understand what is the anti defection law see the anti defection law was introduced under the 10th schedule of the indian constitution through the 52nd amendment act that was enacted by the parliament in 1985 in order to tackle political defections where elected legislators were defecting from one party to another as they were lured with bribes and office of profit by the other parties this essentially refers to the practice of horse trading where elected legislators are bought particularly by the opposition parties in order to destabilize elected governments this became a common practice in 1960s and 1970s and it even gave rise to a popular phrase aya ram gaya ram because a particular legislator by the name ram he shifted parties multiple times in a short period of time so this practice of political defection was threatening the stability of democratically elected governments and hence to arrest the trend and to ensure that party members obey the orders of the party the anti defection law was introduced as the 10th schedule into the indian constitution through the 52nd constitution amendment act this anti defection law served two purposes the first purpose which was the main purpose was to preserve the stability of elected governments and to ensure that legislators elected from a party do not defect to the other party in this regard the speaker of the house has been given the sole authority to take action against such defectors and initiate disqualification proceedings against them as per the provisions of article 102 of the indian constitution but the drawback of the law is that this power of the speaker has been made discretionary and the law does not set any time period within which 
the disqualification proceeding against the legislator has to be decided by the Speaker of the House. So this allows the Speaker to exercise his discretion, often in favour of the party that he belongs to, and thereby the role of the Speaker has become more and more political, even though the expectation is that the Speaker has to be apolitical and has to disconnect and disassociate himself or herself from the political party that they belong to. Quite often, political parties employ horse trading to purchase MLAs and MPs from the other side. And when this threatens the stability of the elected government, the Speaker ends up playing a political role while initiating and deciding upon the disqualification proceedings, thereby affecting his neutrality as the Speaker of the House. Upon this, as per the law and the Constitution, courts have no oversight over the disqualification proceedings, and the affected legislators can seek judicial remedy or judicial review only against the decision of the Speaker or with regard to his inaction in deciding upon the disqualification proceedings. So essentially, the anti-defection law has become ineffective in preventing defection and has failed to ensure the stability of elected governments. Because the practice of defection and horse trading has continued despite the anti-defection law and hence the writer of the column criticizes the anti-defection law. The second purpose of the anti-defection law is to ensure that party members, that is legislators elected from a particular party, obey the orders of the party and to ensure that they cast their vote as directed by the whip of the party. If an elected MP or a MLA violates the whip of the party, and casts a vote against the orders of the party, the elected legislator stands to be disqualified as per the provisions of anti-defection law. This, according to the writer of the column, is an absurd provision because it essentially makes the legislator accountable only to the party and not to the people who have elected the legislator from their constituency. It essentially restricts and limits the freedom of expression of the legislator because this is a very wide-ranging provision and it not only applies with regard to voting on major bills, like no confidence motions and money bills, but it also applies for all the votes in the House, in fact on every bill and every issue that is debated in the House. This provision of the anti-defection law even applies to the Rajya Sabha and the legislative councils, which have no role to play in ensuring the stability of the government. So essentially it ends up curbing the freedom of the legislator and makes them obey the orders of the party without ever questioning the party's decisions. And thus, according to the writer, this fails the duty of a legislator to be responsible to the people who have elected them, and thus defeats the purpose of an electoral democracy, as elected legislators have to blindly follow the orders and directions given by the whip of their party. So the writer concludes by saying that the anti-defection law has failed on both the counts. It has been ineffective to prevent defection, while on the other hand, it has defeated the very purpose of a representative democracy by making the legislators blindly follow the orders of their party. Hence, the writer of the column calls the anti-defection law an absurd law and calls for a reform in this regard, which could address both the issues that we have discussed. Now, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, increasing the retirement age of Supreme Court judges is a sure shot way to reform the higher judiciary. Do you agree? Critically discuss. The second question. Examine UNESCO's global agreement on the ethics of AI in detail. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer rating portal for which the link has been given in the description box below. On this note, I would like to conclude my discussion for today. And if you found the initiative to be helpful, do let us know by liking the video, share these videos with fellow aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.